everyone. I am Dr. Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez, Professor of Zoology at the Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, and the Curator for Birds at the UPLB Museum of Natural History. I will be your MC and your moderator for today. Thank you for taking time to join us today for, for today's MNH Quincentennial Commemorations webinar series called Balik Tanaw, Kasaysayan at Kalikasan with the topic, Sidip sa Kaghapon, Muluscan Research and Collections from the Spanish Period to the Present. To start our session today, let us all welcome our beautiful director, Dr. Marian Pulido de Leon, who will be giving her welcome remarks. Dr. De Leon. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, isang mapagpala at makakalika sa umaga sa ating lahat. Welcome to the UPLD Museum of Natural History's Quincentina Commemoration 10-part webinar series. The UPLD MNH, ang Pilipinas sa loob ng limang siglo, features online webinar series and virtual exhibit focusing on a theme, Balik Tanaw, Kasaysayan at Kalikasan. The 10-part webinar series will give us the chronicles and highlights in Philippine natural history for the past 500 years and the gaps and opportunities for research on the diverse Philippine flora and fauna. Last June 30, we had our fourth webinar. It's a tandem presentation by Professor Philip Alviola and Professor Judy Limbi Malibot, both MNH curators for zoological and wildlife. The presentation entitled Mammiferios Terrestres Conocidos de Filipinas, Philippine Mammalian Expeditions During the Spanish Colonial Period was delivered by Professor Philip. It gave us a comprehensive historical account of important discoveries and explorations in the Philippines starting from AD 1494 to AD 1898. For those who missed this presentation, you can still watch them via the MNH YouTube channel. We are now halfway through uh, with our seminar, webinar series for the Quincentina commemoration. Our fifth webinar presentation will be given by another esteemed MNH curator of the zoological and wildlife, Dr. Emmanuel Ryan de Chavez, entitled Silip sa Kagahapon, Moluscan Research and Collections from the Spanish Period to Present. Let us all take a peek on the significant and historical Moluscan researches of the past as we listen to Dr. Ryan, our MC and moderator and former director, Dr. Juan Carlos de Gonzalez, will further introduce our speaker. And on behalf of the MNH Local Organizing Committee Chair, Mr. Florante Cruz, and Co-Chair, Mr. Alvin Fajardo, and the rest of the MNH curators and staff, allow me to thank you for your active participation in our QCC webinars, and we look forward to having you all in the next five more presentations by our experts. Buenos dias, buenos dias a todo. Uh, Dios de bendiga y esta en buen salud para a todo. Thank you very much and have a blessed day to all. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Director De Leon, for that jubilant welcome remarks. Thank you. So before I introduce our special guest speaker today, I would like to remind you of the house rules. First, make sure that your audio is on mute and your video is turned off. Practice good webinar etiquette. And second, please use the Zoom webinar question and answer Q&A feature to send the questions. For those who are watching on our YouTube stream, just put your questions in the comments area and our technical assistant will copy your questions to the Zoom Q&A. All right, so I have the pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Emmanuel Ryan C. De Chavez. Dr. De Chavez is an associate professor at the Animal Biology Division, Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, University of the Philippines, Los Banos, and also the curator for Mollusk at the UBLB Museum of Natural History. He completed his Bachelor of Science degree in Biology with a major in Zoology at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, 
cum laude, and took his Master of Science degree in zoology also at UPL, and took his PhD in life sciences at Tohoku University in Sendai City, Japan. He has been teaching undergraduate and graduate courses in the university for 19 years. He's also involved in the development of new courses, both in the BS Biology and MS Zoology programs of UPLD. He was a recipient of the Outstanding Junior Faculty Award of the College of Arts and Sciences, UPLD in 2009, and has been a country representative and a fellow at the 2016 HOPE meeting with Nobel Prize laureates in Tsukuba, Japan. Amazing. His research expertise is on tropical malacology, community ecology, evolutionary biology, and ecotoxicology. He delves into studies focused on land snails to explain how species and communities vary, adapt, and evolve in rainforest and karst ecosystems amid natural and anthropogenic changes. He also conducts research using freshwater mollusks as models to determine the effects of various heavy metals and organic pollutants on the early development of invertebrates. He is the current president of the Malacological Society of the Philippines and a member of UNITAS Malacologica. Tongue twister. Friends, I now give the floor to Dr. Emmanuel Ryan de Chavez. Thank you very much, Dr. de Chavez. Thank you, JC, for that wonderful introduction. Um, let me share my slide first. So for this morning, I have the pleasure to give a talk on a group of organisms that are not well studied uh, or not as popular as other animals in the Philippines. But despite their so-called unpopularity, okay, they are very important and they have been a part of the lives of Filipinos as a form of food, ornaments, currency, and also a source of medicine. So for this morning, I'd like to talk about um, stories about the group of organisms known as the mollusk. The title is Silip sa Kagahapon, the Molluscan Research and Collections from the Spanish Period to the Present. Now, my talk is divided into five chapters, five stories, five major points in uh, Philippine history uh, concerning the mollusks. So the first part, I'll talk about mollusks and our er early ancestors, some prehistoric and uh, pre-colonial finds. In chapter two, I'll talk about more on the status of malacology and collections during the Spanish period. In chapter three, I'll talk about the research during the American and the uh, Spanish, uh, Japanese occupation. In chapter four, what would be the developments in malacological research in post-war Philippines? And lastly, in chapter five, I'll discuss some current themes and future directions and prospects in malacological research in the Philippines. So let's begin our story. So the first question is, why is the Philippines rich in malacofaunal diversity? So the, the Philippines is considered as one of the centers of uh, Moluscan diversity and there are different factors that can be uh, uh, that can explain this kind of interesting phenomenon. First would be the geological history of the Philippines. Now the Philippines being an ancient um, archipelago first uh, arose during the um, Oligocene, but further development occurred during the early Miocene up to the early Pliocene. So it has a very complex geological, bathymetric and even climatic history. So these factors um, somehow uh, provided an ideal environment for the natural evolution of many diverse mollusks. Now, the Philippines, as we all know, is one of the center of marine biodiversity in the world. Okay, so this is part of the coral triangle and located along the, uh, near the equator, which is an ideal region of the world for the speciation of many 
uh, marine organisms. Now, the Philippines also undergone a uh, complex climatic history, especially during the uh, ice age or the Pleistocene, wherein you have the glaciation during the, uh, at the northern part and the southern part of the world, and the water receded. Now, this uh, recession of water enabled for the formation of what we call PAIX or Pleistocene island complexes, forming what we call these um, different um, islands that are interconnected. However, after the end of the ice age, there's a recession or there's now uh, the, not in recession, but the rise again of the water separating these former complex islands. Now, because of this um, uh, history, there are different centers of gastropod and land snail diversity in the Philippines. For instance, in the work of Vallejo, he pointed out that uh, in different parts of the Philippines, there are various high diversity centers. For instance, for cone snails, you have Southern uh, Luzon, uh, Cebuan Island in Northern Palawan, especially covering um, the seas around uh, Mindoro. Then you have the Cowries, um, high concentration along the Eastern region in Samar and Leyte, even in the Northern region of Mindanao. While uh, in the Central Visayan region, the highest diversity uh, can, be at, uh, can be found among the cones, the Cowries, and even the olive snails. Now, this um, diversity can be explained by the uh, current uh, flow of water because there are some restrictions because of this formation of the island. So because of the restriction of flow of current, some of the um, larvae and some of the mollusks that are formerly pelagic and can be transported to other parts of the Philippines become restricted. Okay, in these different regions, and therefore uh, providing an isolated environment for their increased speciation. Now, for terrestrial environment, now in the work of Dickerson in 1928, he also established several uh, provinces for land snails, wherein most of the helicostylid or the helicostyla snails are concentrated in the zone. Okay, and um, some are even concentrated also in. Uh, Mindanao. Now, this uh, concentration can also be attributed to the PAIX. Okay. So, to give you a perspective, um, the Philippines would have around 20,000 out of the 70,000 species described worldwide, so accounting 2 to 4 percent, which are endemic. But for land snails, we are um, hypothesizing that it's around 90% uh, in endemicity. Now, the Seleuci is considered as the world center for diversity of olive snails, as indicated in this picture. And also have the Philippines as the center of subfamily Helicostylinae for land snails, very similar to the other centers of land snail diversity. For example, the, uh, the Ampedro moose snails in mainland Southeast Asia, but in the Philippines, um, our archipelago is considered as the center of diversity of the sub subfamily Helicostylinae. Uh, now, these mollusks have been a part of our history, uh, even. Uh, before the Spanish colonization. So in this series of slides, I'll just give you some ideas or some um, evidences that indeed uh, mollusks been a part of um, early uh, Filipinos uh, as a form of their food, uh, ornaments, and even tools. So let's begin in Batanes Islands. So excavation, okay, is a... Uh, they discovered um, some shells or middens in this particular region of the Philippines. So in this particular region, they discovered some uh, conus, tridacna, cowries, and other marine mollusks, as indicated here. 
Now, based from study of Siabo, uh, around the estimated around 960 to around 1400 AD, so the inhabitants, the early inhabitants of Batanes are very much dependent or they make use of mollusks as a form of their diet. Interestingly, majority of the mollusks that they are consuming or they're using are land snails, um, 81%. Marine, 16%, and around 3% freshwater. So this gives us an idea that maybe during that early times of the early occupants of Batanes, um, they are not as active in gleaning marine species, and most are um, dependent on uh, mollusks that can be found in forests in Batanes Islands. Now, they also make use of various shells as a form of pool. For instance, this is the operculum of this uh, turbo shell, turbo marmoratus. And based on their findings, they somehow designed this operculum as a form of hooks for fishing. Okay, So these are fragments discovered in um, Itbayat, one of the major islands of Batanes. Now going uh, to other places in the Philippines, we go now to Palawan, okay? So based on studies and excavations during the 1968 until 1970, uh, one of the notable uh, finds would be uh, those in Pilandok and Sagung uh, caves, wherein uh, the, they found out that the occupants or the residents here, um, ancient uh, Filipinos are hunter-gatherers during the late Pleistocene to post Pleistocene. And this also gives us an idea that this is a possible transition from feeding marine to freshwater and land molds because of the shift in the frequency of the species of mollusks that they are consuming. So these are their major finds. So 85 species excavated, around 20 families are marine, 14 blackish, Three families are freshwater mollusks, and two families, uh, around six species, are land snails. Interestingly, these mollusks, aside from using them as a source of food, they're also used as grave goods. What is a grave good? So these are ornaments or materials that are placed in the dead body of their loved ones uh, during their burial. Okay, so pabaon, kumbaga. So, Interestingly, they've uh, discovered that uh, there are different, some species of mollusks are being used as grave goods. For example, uh, melo is one, the trumpet conch, and even lambis, spider conch. And they also put uh, accessories made of shells, uh, particularly uh, from Conus moreletti in here for, their, uh, for the dead body of their loved ones. And uh, they also make use of another species, Tachycardium plagum, and other. Uh, they also discovered in the cave that they also make use of other species of cone snails for ornamental purposes. Now, um, this is another example. So again, in uh, Duyong Cave, also discovery of grave goods. Um, Tridacna gaigas, and interestingly, they make use of this areca. Okay, uh, the shells are used to contain uh, this betel nut, so nganga. Okay, so there, this is the example of cone snails that are uh, that was discovered in this area. Another one is the manungul. Uh, cave in Palawan, so where you have the Manungu jar, uh, a natural, uh, national uh, treasure of the Philippines. Now, aside from the jar, they also discovered bracelets, okay? Uh, the period would be around 710 to 890 BC. Another find uh, was in Bubog in Ilin Island, northern Mindoro. So in here, uh, they found these uh, lambis, spider conch, wherein there's a regular cut 
in the shell. So this would indicate that this uh, crack in the shell or opening the shell is due to the use of hammer stones by early Filipinos. Um, this was also observed in telescopium and in trochoid shells. In Mindanao, uh, discovery in Ayub Cave in Itong Sarangani, uh, this around 5, 5 BC to 370 AD. So aside from these uh, uh, jars, anthropomorphic burial jars, uh, similar uh, grave goods such as mello and cassis were also discovered. Uh, also the discovery of shell spoons, bracelets. Uh, so we can see the pattern that our early ancestors would have high preference for conus as a form of ornament. In Agusan in Butuan, uh, Agusan del Norte, um, also 62 species uh, were discovered in uh, archaeological sites. Um, they also use uh, this kind of bivalve as a form of net sinkers for their fishing. Uh, Conus literatus and silana are used as ornaments in the form of bracelets. They also eat freshwater uh, snails and bivalves. And this kind of uh, plant, Julian uh, 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 Kawasans. Other sites in the Philippines uh, with uh, archaeological finds we found in Narciso, Bondok, in Quezon Province, Balingsay, Bolinao, Pangasinan, and in Calatagan. So uh, this, uh, the findings here would vary from uh, ornaments, grave goods, and a form of uh, food. Uh, they also discover some cowrie shells. Now these cowrie shells or sea guide that we use in Songka uh, during the ancient times are also used as a form of currency. Now from the ancient Filipinos, we go now to our indigenous Filipinas. So shells is one of the popular materials that are used for ornaments. An example would be this uh, mother of pearl earrings or kalipan in Ilonga tribe. Another form of accessory can be found among isneg, known as sepatal. You have the ginutu, which is a ceremonial sword uh, of male ifugao made of tridak nagaiga shells. Another uh, belt from botok is made of conus and other shells. And in here, you have an Ifugao woman wearing a, a necklace made of shell. And interestingly, among the Bulul, okay, or the Ifugao rice gods, you'd notice that the eyes are inlaid with shells, okay? Marine shells. I think uh, the one that I was served, for example, in uh, UP Baguio exhibit, they, the shell is made up of architectonica, a type, a type of symmetrical marine shells. So, as we observe, mollusks have been part of the lives of our Philippines. Now, we go now to our main uh, story, chapter two. What are some of the important uh, malacological research collections during this period? So the title of this chapter is Molluscus de las Filipinas. So let's start with some of the important um, expeditions uh, concerning uh, malacological research. So one of the important ones would be La Favorite in 1829 to 1832. This was headed by a French navigator, Cyril Pierre Laplace. So the intention of this expedition is to circumnavigate and to restore the French influence through trade uh, agreements, particularly in the Pacific. Now, Together with the reestablishment of the strength of the French, um, they also made some scientific discoveries and some of the stop points uh, is the Philippines. Now, during this expedition, uh, they've collected some uh, specimens from the Philippines and a land snail, Calococlea valencianesi, was described emanating from this expedition. Another important expedition is Challenger in 1829 and in 1832. 
So this is also uh, for scientific exploration. Now this expedition is, uh, the chief scientist in this expedition is Charles Winville Thompson. And they've served throughout the Philippines, particularly in along Sambuanga uh, and Iloilo and in Manila. Now in this expedition, they collected 25, or they have identified 25 species uh, that was described in this expedition. Now, let's go now to the important malacologists. Unfortunately, upon my research, there are very few Filipinos that are, um, that are involved in malacological research during this time, with exception of uh, the one that I will discuss later on. Uh, so most of our malacological knowledge are based from the research and findings of European conchologists and malacologists. And some of these malacologists and naturalists would go to our country, make collections, and even though that they are not, what, they are not specialized in malacology, they would send the specimens to other scientists around Europe for the identification and description of a possible new species coming from the country. And one of these, is you coming? Okay, he stayed uh, in the Philippines, in Singapore, in the Moluccas for four years. So with this discovery, uh, have many uh, collections. So he's known as the Prince of Collectors. And when he went to the Philippines in 1835, uh, as I've said, uh, made many collections, uh, around 3,000 species and. 550 of the collections of mollus were land snails. There's an interesting anecdote uh, in the experience of uh, coming in the Philippines. So in his statement that in the Philippines, uh, the technique of you coming is to ask the natives or uh, the Filipinas in just that time to collect as many mollus, especially in the jungles. And he was awestruck because of the many specimens and most of them are new to science, okay? So they are just uh, collecting here and there. So that is one of the reason why he made such massive collection. And then as I mentioned earlier, so these um, specimens were sent to various scientists around Europe and they are the ones that would describe them. And of course, with acknowledgement that this is from uh, Cummings collection. So an example of these are these uh, snails like Calococlea festiva, described by Donovan in 1825. So this is a land snail um, that can be found in Northern Luzon. You have Calococlea sonifera. He give it to Pfeiffer. And you have another one is Nina exilis. So all of these, uh, were from Cummings collection when he went to the Philippines. Another important European malacologist is Lovell Augustus Ryu. Okay, so his contribution in Philippine malacology is the publication of a book known as Conchologica Iconica. Okay, with twenty volumes, and most of these specimens were based from Cummings collection. So these are examples of his find and. From the Cummings collection, he was able to describe many uh, species. An example is Suma botanica. So this is an endemic uh, sinistra land snail in Batanes Islands. And you also have Chlorea fibula, which is an endemic land snail in Cebu. Now, following Rib is another group of uh, malacologists, actually they are a family of naturalist oncologists, the Sowers B. So there are three generations. So G, B, Sower B, the first, the second, and the third. Okay. Now, uh, Sower B, the second, and the third are responsible for the publication of a book known as Thesaurus Contiliorum with five volumes and a chapter is devoted from Cummings collection. 
And another noted uh, work of Sowers B is the Manual of Conchology. And they also contributed to Reeves' icon, uh, Conchologica Iconica. So this is an, uh, an example of pages from uh, Sowers B's Thesaurus Conchiliorum showing some of the very beautiful illustrations of specimens from the Philippines, from the abalones, the nerids, the olives, and the turbos. So these are examples of um, specimens that were identified and described by Sowersby. We have Calococlea chrysochella, Helicostella florida, which is an endemic land snail, of Indoro. We have Helicostyla annulata, which is a very beautiful yellowish land snail in uh, northern Luzon. And we have Hemitrichella cetera. So this land snail is characterized by having tiny hair-like structures in their shell. And we have Helicostyla modesta, all described by uh, Sowersby. Now, following Sowers B is Carl Gottfried Semper. So he's a German zoologist and malacologist. He also made some expeditions in the Philippines, particularly in the zone, Bohol, Leyte, and in Mindanao. His major contribution is the publication of a book known as Resen in Archipel Ter Philippinen, which is a five volume okay, of 10 from this uh, series from 1868 until 1916. Now, aside from land snails and marine mollusks, another, another noted um, specimens that were uh, illustrated by uh, Simper are nudibranchs. Okay, so as far as we know, this is the first book that illustrated or reported the various species of nudibranchs in the Philippines at, at that time. Next, we have a Spanish malacologist, Don Joaquin Gonzalez Hidalgo y Rodriguez. His major contribution is his book known as Obras Malacologicas, published in 1890. Uh, other books um, attributed to him would be the uh, part one of Studio Prelimina Prelimina Preliminary Sobre El Fauna Malacologica de las Islas Filipinas in 1891. And he also um, conducted several uh, taxonomic uh, research, such as species description and illustration, particularly focusing on land snails, coclostyla. And another interesting thing about uh, Dr. Uh, Hidalgo is he has active communication and collaboration with Dr. Jose Rizal. Okay, so some of the rare specimens of Dr. Jose Rizal were sent to Don Hidalgo for further identification. So this is his work of Brasmalacologica showing different pages, very uh, fine illustration of land snails. And from this book, I think this is the first time that reported micro land snails. Okay, so this one. So you have a uh, small nanina and microclamis were first uh, reported and illustrated in this book. Okay, and he also delved in uh, species description. One of his noted uh, discovery or uh, naming of a new species is Risotta quadrasi in 1890. Now, another one is uh, Jose Florencio Quadras. Okay, he's also a Spanish malacologist. He's well known for his book, Catalogo de la Colección. De Moluscos de Filipinas, Existente en la Inspección de la de Montes. Okay, very tongue uh, twister book in 1893. So it also explored various islands of the Philippines, particularly focusing in Leyte, Samar, and Limasau. Now, because of um, his active uh, work in Philippine malacology, several malacologists also named some of their collections or some of their uh, specimens coming from the Philippines named after uh, Don Quadras, such as Ampidromus quadrasi. Okay, this was described by Hidalgo in 1887. 
So these are examples of pages from that book. So this is a monograph or listing of various known uh, mollus in the Philippines at that time. So from cephalopods, gastropods, and even bivalves. Now, the next one is Otto Franz von Mollendorf. He's also a German malacologist. Um, he also worked with Dr. Jose Rizal by accepting some samples, but focusing on marine uh, specimens. He also uh, collaborated with Quadras uh, for um, the identification of freshwater snails. Now, his major publication um, can be seen in Geisen, uh, in Archipel der Philippinen. So these are examples of uh, freshwater mollusks described by uh, von Mollendorf. So we have Ancomelania hopensis quadrasi. We all know this as the intermediate host of Schistosoma japonicum, which is a, a trematode parasite afflicting many Filipinos until today. And we also have the freshwater snail, Radix quadrasi, uh, which is a very good model for ecotoxicological studies. So these are some uh, examples of pages from his publications. And these are examples of land snails described by Dr. Molendor, such as Calococlea lignaria and Chrysalis rolei, which is an endemic snail found in Mindoro. Now, as I mentioned, you have a parade of European malacologies. And I've also mentioned earlier that very rare to find Philippine oncologists or even malacologists. I know from my research, it's very interesting that our national hero, Dr. Isrizal, can, con can be considered as one of the first, if not the first, uh, Filipino oncologists with systematic collection of models. Uh, quoting uh, Dr. Jose Bantug, a Rizal scholar, out of all the accomplishments of Dr. Rizal in science, his study on the local shells stand up above all the rest. So we all know that Dr. Rizal Rizal is an ophthalmologist, he's a linguist, and also delved in various fields of zoology and botany. But his collections, but his work on uh, shells can be considered as one of his greatest achievements. So most of his malacological work uh, were conducted during his exile in Dapitan from 1892 to 1896. During his time, that's all the time in the world actually, uh, when he was exiled. So he made uh, make use of his time well. So he did many uh, important works at each build irrigation, etc., and even uh, delve in different uh, fields of sciences. And of course, collection of shells. So he collected around 349 shells at that time. And he identified, or not identified, but uh, from this collection, 206 species were identified, formally identified. So he's also systematic in his malacological work, uh, wherein he sent some duplicates with annotations to his professor at Ateneo de Manila at that time, Padre Joaquin Anion. Uh, he sent rare specimens to Padre Sanchez and Don Jose Florencio Cuadras for identification. And I mentioned earlier, the rarest were sent to Spain to Don Joaquin Gonzalez uh, Hidalgo for verification and identification. So, Interestingly, uh, from the different epistolario or uh, letters of Isal he made during his time, uh, this letter addressed to A.B. Mayor because he's also interested in depositing some of his uh, collected shells in other parts of the world, particularly in Germany. So he communicated with uh, scientist A.B. Mayer and he, from this letter, he mentioned that he has several collections of reptiles, crustaceans, beetles, uh, and these were uh, stored in boxes, uh, but he has some problem preserving them because they are very limited 
uh, alcohols and jar to contain them. And in the second paragraph of this letter, he mentioned that he's also offering his collection of shells to Dr. Mayer. Okay, but uh, he, he mentioned here that Dr. Mayer should be the one to pay for the uh, courier service of these uh, specimens. Okay, so in Epistolario Resalino number 124, so this is the list of the different uh, mollusks that he sent to Dr. Mayer, around 102 shells uh, with 25 species were sent in Dresden, Germany. And these collections, if you are lucky enough to go to Dresden, are full, uh, can, can still be seen in the different museums of uh, Dresden, Germany. And here are some of them. Okay, so we have uh, Pos, Saint Papus, okay. We have the uh, Triton, Triton Anus, Ranella Rana, uh, Nasa Arcularia. Another one would be Pyramidella Rebellus, Cancellaria Asperalia, and Cerisium Bertagus. Now, this species is very interesting. If you are familiar with the comic created by uh, the Procerisal, the turtle, and the monkey, in one of the uh, section of the story, uh, there's a mention of snails uh, put on the uh, trunk of the banana, okay, in order for the, uh, uh, the banana with the monkey and the turtle. And uh, it's um, identified that he is mentioning the Sirichum vertagus as the uh, snails in that story. Then you have Natica alla papillonis. Okay. So those are the amazing and spectacular collections of uh, Jose Rizal. But the question is when he died in Doneta, what happened to his collection? Okay. So Based from research, his shell collection uh, were temporarily stored in wooden boxes. Now, these wooden boxes are for jeans, okay, for decors. So these are the temporary storage uh, cases for the shells. And these were sent to Manila from the Pitan and initially sent to Narcisa Rizal, who Live in, uh, who lives in Binondo at that time. Then afterwards, it was transferred to Rizal's another sister, Trinidad Rizal. Now the question is, what happened to the original collection after Trinidad Rizal? Uh, still uh, questionable. But what we have now are the sample specimens from this collection displayed in Port Santiago. So, after the pandemic, and if we are able to go to Manila and Fort Santiago, one of the highlights of our of the tour there are the different shells displayed, and these are the ones collected by Dr. Rizal, our representative of Rizal's uh, shell collection. Now, because of Rizal's love for mollusks, I guess. Uh, he also made mention in his uh, last poem, uh, Mi Ultimo Dios, his term, Perla del Mar de Oriente, okay? Pearl of the Orient Seas. Okay? And this Pearl of the Orient Seas line can also be seen in our national anthem. And I think he's attributing to the uh, South Sea uh, Pearl forming bivalve pintada maxima here. Okay, so even in his last uh, moments, he also remembered that indeed uh, the Philippines can be uh, compared to the pearl, the, which is the national gem of the Philippines. Okay, so after the Spanish uh, period, we go now to another chapter of our Moluscan story. So this time focusing our uh, time during the American and the Japanese period. So the title is From Risotta 
to Akatina. So during this time, uh, there are also some important expeditions, and one of them would be Albatross in 1907 and 1910. So this is marine expedition in the Pacific and Indian Ocean, and they have some stopover in the Philippines. And one of the scientists aboard this expedition is Paul Barch. He is a malacologist, American malacologist. Uh, then also a noted, a notable um, discovery of this expedition would be uh, Scutus, okay? And this uh, uh, Pistobranks. Unfortunately, uh, there are no accounts, only uh, some paintings of this opistobranch by Komataro Ito, uh, which is housed in the Smithsonian. So during this American period, the most prominent, prominent malacologist, I think, is Dr. Paul Barch. Okay, so he made some important uh, contributions during this time. So among them would be a comprehensive study of Philippine shipworm. He also made some studies in Bankia, describe new land snails, uh, notes and researches on uh, freshwater snails such as Bibiparia, and a review on the taxonomy of the land snail, Paisota. So this is an example of a uh, publication generated by Dr. Barsh, wherein he described four new species of land snails in the Philippines, particularly Toclostyla uh, worseteri, Toclostyla fugensis, Leptopoma free, and Coptokylus macrigori. Another one is his work on bifiparid snails. Uh, they, um, he described a uh, new species. And what is interesting is this, most of the species here are collected from Lake Lanao in Mindanao. And this is one of the research that solidified that indeed uh, Lake Lanao is one of the center of bibiparid speciation in the country. Another one is his uh, seminal work on the land snail, say, uh, land snail risota, wherein he somehow organized uh, this, uh, the taxonomy of this, uh, this genus. Okay, actually there are uh, 14 species of Risota in the Philippines right now. And from this publication, he organized several of them. For example, uh, Risota otahitana, which is the bayoko that we can, uh, we can see in Mount Makili. Now, he, based on from his study, he identified 17 subspecies. Another one is Risota uranus that can be found in Polio Islands as well as in parts of Bicol. He described four subspecies, Risota sauli, three subspecies, Risota antoni, nine subspecies, Risota molieri, six subspecies, and even described a new Risota species, Risota webi. Now, during this time, uh, another important work is by a Filipino mineralogist and uh, malacologist, Dr. Leopoldo Faustino, in his short life, he made some important contributions. For example, he is the one who published these important works on Philippine malacology, such as the Summary of Philippine Marine and Freshwater Mollusks in 1928, Summary of Land Shells of the Philippines in 1930, also studied fossils of Philippine Islands in 1932, also made a list of edible mollusks of Manila in 1933 and identified some of the shells of industrial importance in 1935. Okay. Now, during this time also, you have the emergence of a very important institution, which is the Philippine Bureau of Science. Okay. So this is established in 1901 under the American uh, jurisdiction. Okay, so this is based, uh, from the Union of Bureau of uh, Government Laboratories and Mines and the Bureau of uh, Science. Now, this is located in Manila, okay, and it was the central, it has a central scientific library 
of the Philippine government at that time. Okay, so in this uh, institution, several important uh, collections are deposited. So some of the works or some of the uh, uh, the collections from different expeditions, especially from Albatross, were also deposited here. Some seashell collections and even some of the bivalve um, identified in the Philippines are also collected, are also deposited in this institution at that time. However, Second World War occurred. Unfortunately, we lost a number of important specimens from this building, and these are irreplaceable treasures. Okay, so most of the type specimens for most of the uh, mollusks that we have in the Philippines are lost because of the destruction, uh, because of the war. Okay, now at, right now uh, the the site where you have the Philippine uh, the Bureau of Science is now occupied by the building of the National Institute of Health of UP Manila. Okay. Okay, so after these two research during the American period, we go now, uh, what would be the research or what would be the important molecological story during the Second World War? And from my research and from my uh, opinion, this is the introduction of the Akatina Folica or this Akatina Folica or what we call the Japanese garden snail or the African uh, giant snail, okay? So during this time, uh, it was, introduced by Japanese soldier, okay, as a form of emergency food, para siyang uh, Jollibee or McDonald, as an emergency food. Uh, the first report was in 1942 during the war. It was initially observed in Pampanga, then Santo Tomas. I'm not sure if this is Santo Tomas, Batangas. And by 1949, because of the adaptability of this tropical land snail from Africa, almost all the provinces of Luzon were already infested. Okay, and at this time, Akatina fulica or least Akatina fulica is considered as one of the most invasive alien species worldwide. So in here, uh, this is a figure showing the spread of Akatina or least Akatina from Africa going to other parts of the world. So the main origin would be continental Africa. Then it was transferred in some of the islands uh, of Indian Ocean, particularly Madagascar, Mauritius, and Moyet. And from there, because of trades, it was spread in India, parts of Southeast Asia, Japan, although in Japan, it was an unsuccessful because it's not adapted to the climate of Japan. Uh, then spread elsewhere, particularly in North America and South America. So in the Philippines, as I mentioned, the origin or the route of introduction would be from Formosa or Taiwan uh, in 1942, then spread throughout, okay? So in the research of Fontanilla in 2014, this is further supported, wherein you have more haplotype diversity in Africa and in Moyet. And in Mauritius, these are the centers for the haplotype diversification that is spread in the different tropical region of the world, okay? And this is the place wherein we have a unique haplotype for the Katina, this one, okay? So from Africa, then uh, concentrated in uh, Moyet, in Indian Ocean, then introduced to other parts of the world. And because of that uh, massive geographical differences, it resulted to the formation of a new haplotype. So we have haplotype E, which is from the Philippines. So unfortunately, it's very difficult to control Isakatina. So there are different, um, there are different uh, control measures. Uh, during my uh, field work, most of our uh, most of our forests, rainforests are already uh, infested with this snail. So hopefully, we, we become conscientious that 
in areas where in there's no introduction yet, you have to prevent them from uh, spreading further. So those are the major stories during the American and uh, Japanese period. Now in this chapter four, what are now the developments of malacology in post-war Philippines? So there are different fields. As you've noticed, most of the fields of research would be on taxonomy and in systematics. But at this point in time, you have now many developments in other areas of malacology in the Philippines. One of them would be in the field of shellfish industry and aquaculture. So during the 1930s up to the early 1950s, 1960s, you have the uh, development of uh, this uh, oyster. So we have three oysters that are being cultivated right now. You have Crassostrea iridaile or Megalania balenata and Crassostrea malabonensis. And it was spread throughout the country. So in here you have a map showing you the different areas of the Philippines where oyster farming was introduced. So there are two uh, methods of culturing uh, oysters in the Philippines. We have the oyster steak culture, where the oysters are allowed to attach in a bamboo matrix, uh, submerged and attached to a substratum. And the other one is what we call oyster hanging or beating wherein the oysters are tied on a rope and hung and submerged in uh, marine water. And another, thing, another interesting story is the story about our Tahong, Perna viridis. It was during the early or earlier, uh, this Perna viridis was considered as a pest, peste na mga uh, fishermen, okay, or pest, uh, particularly mga oyster farmers, but it was uh, accepted, especially during the 1950s, where it was introduced as an alternative uh, food source. It was started in Binakayan, Cavite, in the 1950s, then uh, it grew from there. Okay, so it is now accepted as an edible mollusk, and you have many areas of the Philippines with uh, the culture of Perna. So in the 1960s, uh, Mr. Rasalan, then commissioner of the Philippine Fisheries Commission, uh, further ordered some stocks from Thailand that were also introduced in the country. Okay, And in the middle of the 1970s, the mussel farming spread outside the, Fili uh, outside the Manila Bay area in, in other parts of the country. So in the 1980s, he came up with a manual on the biology and culture of mussels for a more scientific approach in culturing these forms. Another story of a bivalve, this is from the works of Dr. Ricardo Gomez, a national scientist. His primary work is concentrated on uh, Redacna. Uh, so he initiated giant clam spawning. Uh, particularly the Tridacna de Rasa, Squamosa, Maxima, and Hippopus Hippopus. And he published manual culturing the giant clams, uh, hatchery, ocean nursery, and even stock assessment and spread, transplanted them in other parts of the country uh, that are uh, where you have already local extirpation of these uh, bivalves. For cephalopods, the major work during this time would be from Gilbert Boss, who wrote Cephalopods of the Philippine Islands, wherein he have a comprehensive uh, listing down and illustrations of the various cephalopods uh, captured in the Philippines. Now, another field of research that emanated during post-war Philippines would be the field of conotoxin research. Now, this was initiated by two prominent Filipino scientists. Dr. Lourdes Cruz and Dr. Baldomero Oliveira. So throughout the 1980s to 1990s, he made, they made several important discoveries on the different toxins coming from a snail, conus, okay? And they've isolated the toxin from this conus, particularly conus magus, 
and Connell's geographies. So from the 1980, 1982, 1984, 1985, we have various uh, biochemical uh, analyses that isolated peptides from the conotoxin of these two uh, conus snails. Then in 1999, the major discovery is the isolation of conotolacin, uh, which is uh, from conus geographus. Now, this already a patented drug that can uh, serve as uh, that will have a morphine like. Uh, function. Okay, so these researches are all because of the, the works of Dr. Cruz and Dr. Oliver. Another one in the fields of parasitology, uh, especially focusing on cystosomiasis and on comelania. Now, most of the works in the 1980s, 1990s, and even to the present would be attributed to Dr. Leonardo. Okay, who worked on Oncomelania, who pensis quadras biology, control, management, etc. And another invasive species was also an um, important malacological study in post-war Philippines, particularly the introduction of Kohol or the golden apple snail. Now, similar to Akatina pulika, uh, this snail was introduced as a form of alternative food for farmers and impoverished Filipinos. Now, this Pomacea canaliculata, or the golden apple snail, originally came from Argentina. Uh, but it was introduced again from Taiwan in 1982. Okay? And it was even endorsed by the Department of Agriculture for Rural Livelihood, not knowing that once let out of the rice fields, it will uh, pose devastation because the snails are very voracious eaters of the rice, uh, seed, uh, the rice, okay? However, as I've said, in the mid 1980s, the golden kohol become the biggest, one of the biggest pests in rice industries, not only in the Philippines, but in other rice producing areas of the world. So it resulted in loss of production um, and even uh, immense financial loss, approximately $425 million to even 1.2 billion in the Philippines in the 1990s. So many researches have been conducted in order to address this, but unfortunately, the spread of the uh, golden apple snail is, um, it's very difficult to control already or to exterminate. So management uh, would be the ideal way right now. Now, during this time also, you have the resurgence of malocological uh, systematic research. Uh, in the field of freshwater mollusks, you have Dr. John Birch, who published an identification guide for freshwater snails in 1984. Uh, he covered around 33 genera under 13 families, under three orders. So this is one of the first attempt in systematic identification of uh, freshwater uh, mollusks in the Philippines. And this is in relation to um, the control of different uh, parasites using freshwater mollusks as their host. Another one is uh, research of Dr. Tucker Abbott, his major contribution would be the publication of Compendium or Compedia of Seashells and Land Snails. And another one is the work of Feli Lubrera and Springsteen in 1986, the important book, Shells of the Philippines, which is the first book which is entirely devoted to the identification of mollusks from the Philippines, wherein you, they've listed and uh, presented around 1,600 species from gastropods to cephalopods. Now the shells uh, illustrated here are now uh, stored and displayed in Carpel Shell Museum in Mabini, Batangas. In the 1980s and 1990s, another uh, uh, prominent Filipino malacologist uh, active during this time is Dr. Roberto Pagulayan. So in his work, he made some uh, estimation of the number of 
species of mollusks in the Philippines, around 7,287 at that time. We also worked on uh, limnid snails and pila and identified 15 species of freshwater mollusks from uh, in 1995. And just recently, another important taxonomic work uh, can be attributed to Dr. Guido Pope, a Belgian conchologist based in Cebu. His important work would be the publication of this five volume book known as Philippine Marine Mollusks. This is a comprehensive listing of the various uh, mollusks, uh, marine mollusks, particularly concentrating in the Visayan region. Okay, so there are five volumes right now. So this is Dr. Guido and his son, and this is me and Dr. Delara. Okay, I'm now on my last chapter of this story. So what are now the current themes and future directions in malacological research in the Philippines? So to give you an idea, okay, so throughout the different portion of history, uh, the, the geographical distribution for the journal articles and museum collections Majority are coming from the Central Visayas region. Okay, so most of the malacological publications are from the collection from this region, followed by in 4B and 4A, in all, basically the uh, Southern Tagalog and Mimaropa region. So, how about the number of uh, articles published? Okay, so based from the work of Ramos et al. Majority are concentrated on marine, very few on land, and almost non-existent so freshwater. And the only freshwater mollus publication are concentrated or are linked with parasitological research. So those are the gaps. Uh, in terms of trends in the topics, so uh, present or so throughout time. Uh, there's an uh, increase in variety, as I've mentioned before. So during the early times, taxonomy lang. Pero in the past 20 years, you have variety of fields of malacology that are represented in our malacological literature. So majority would be focusing on um, ecology, agriculture, uh, parasitology, and even taxonomy. So I'm on my last uh, few last slides right now. So what are now the current trends? So based from my uh, research, these are some of the major fields of research that are reflected in the literatures that we have right now in the Philippines concerning malacology. So ecotoxicology, focusing on the effect of these different pollutants, heavy metals, microplastics, and persistent organic pollutants on different mollusks, freshwater and marine, and even examination of human health risks in the consumption of these uh, mollusks. Another field uh, present in our literature right now would be on diversity and community ecology, particularly focusing on various ecosystems like rainforests, karst, protected areas and non-protected areas. And hopefully uh, right now we can also delve in urban biodiversity. And we also have taxonomy and evolutionary biology. Uh, these are the things on DNA barcoding, geometric morphometrics, and next generation sequencing. In the field of parasitology and toxinology, so you have emerging fields of eDNA barcoding and the use of omics in malacological research. So moving on. So what are the various directions for Philippine malacology? So, as I see, uh, we can uh, develop further biomimicry technology. So wherein we make use of uh, uh, inspirations from different mollusks to construct our different uh, buildings, uh, different materials of human use. I also see further modernization of malacological collection, the use of mollusks as a form of cosmeceuticals, which is happening right now and also smart and rapid diagnostics and sensors, particularly for models of parasitological importance. So with those different stories, we can say that the story of Philippine malacology is in the right track. 
Okay? But there are very few workers. Okay? So I hope that uh, in the coming years, okay, so more and more of Filipinos, young Filipinos, would also delve in this field of research. So with that, I end my talk, but I'd like to acknowledge the following. So the snailings who helped me uh, prepare this extensive literature uh, collections. So Harold, Marlon, Kingsley, Fretz, Sidney, and Benji from the Animal Biology Division, from the Malacological Society of the Philippines, and also thank you to the Museum of Natural History for this opportunity. And with that, I end my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dijapas, for that <laughs> splendid and very informative talk. Uh, your talk definitely resonates the importance of malacological research in the Philippines across the centuries and adds emphasis to the MNH theme for this Philippine Quincentennial Commemoration Activity, which is Balik Tanao sa Kasaysayan at ng Kalikasan sa Pilipinas sa loob ng limang siglo. I expect that majority of our audience today will be inspired to study land snails and other mollusks. The Philippine archipelago is indeed blessed, given its rich malacological diversity, high endemism among land snails, an interesting influence of insular biogeographic patterns on these terrestrial gastropods. Your talk also highlights the importance of ethnobiological accounts and the linkages of malacology with anthropology and archaeology. I've learned a lot for today. So let us now have our open forum. To our audience here in Zoom, please use the Q&A feature to send in your questions. To those who are watching via YouTube Live, Leave your questions in the comments box and our technical assistant will copy it to the Zoom Q&A. We will try to answer as many questions as possible given the time allotment. Okay, so for our first question, Q&A, um, the question is from oh, Dr. Sitai de Moanan. Thank you for the in very interesting presentation, Dr. Chavez. Do you think El Fudica is already naturalized in the Philippines? Well, uh, I think, the term naturalized, it should be, well, it was introduced just 50 years ago. Um, maybe another few years would, uh, because at this point, their role is somewhat destructive <laughs> and to be able to consider it as a native or they're already part of the community. So I think we need more research to really prove that they have already have a really functional niche integrated with our native uh, communities of land snails. So I think more research should be uh, done in order to really prove that. Thank you. Um, another question is from Charles Boris Manez. Um, he is from UST Graduate School. Have you encountered researches about relationships of architecture and shells? Some church records reflect use reflect the use of oyster shells as an alternative source of limim, which was used in storm stone mortars and plastering. Or yeah, okay, so that is what we call biomimicry. As I mentioned in my last slide, that moving forward, I think we have to uh, exploit this kind of technology wherein we build structures that are derived from, uh, from mollusks. So some of the, for example, some of the military equipment, for example, submarines, are actually designed right uh, based from the uh, the design of Nautilus, which is a cephalopod. Okay, so how buoyancy control, etc. But I think in the near future, okay, so more and more um, uh, applications of biomimicry derived from models in our architecture, our clothing, and in other facets of our lives will emerge. Thank you. Okay, um, another question is, did the Spanish also influence as Filipinos on how we cook edible mollusks and snails? Well, uh, as far as I know, the Spanish or the Spaniards introduced a technique of cooking, for example, soy frito or, but um, I think it's incorporated, but for example, in Europe where in they are actively eating scargo, uh, I think in our um, in our cuisine, very few or very rare um, are of snail base or mollusk base. Okay, 
but the technique of cooking, I think that's the one that we are uh, we learned from the Spanish. Because most of them, most of the mollusks that we're eating are being eaten by our ancestors in the first place already. Also probably by the Chinese influence as well in the Malay. Yeah, yes. Uh, from Willem Joshua Chan, uh, have two questions. Have this introduced mollusks caused a decline on native or endemic mollusks in the Philippines? Um, actually, there's, there's one, that's one of the research gap that we have right now. But what I can say is they are spreading rapidly, especially in our rainforest. Okay. And since, uh, because this, for example, in the case of Akatina, is an invasive species, this is associated with disturbance. So they have high population of Akatina if a place is disturbed, for example, Kaingin area, or there's cutting of trees, etc., because they can thrive there. And most of our native mollusks or land snails are very much dependent on a pristine environmental condition. Okay, so I think that's the uh, somehow the the relationship of having an akatina in a rainforest or in a karst environment. But in terms of their actual uh, effect, for example, how many species were lost because of the introduction of akatina, I think we don't have a study yet in the Philippines. As compared, for example, in um, in some areas of the world, for example, in Pacific Islands, where you have the introduction of a wolf snail, where it decimated uh, native native uh, snails. Okay, so that's a very uh, famous or infamous effect of an invasive land snail in native fauna. I think. Actually, that actually answers the second question, which is: Have there been any studies in terms of agriculture and controlling pest models? So I think that actually answers that. I question. think there are is first, particularly in the case of Pomacea, mm -hmm. since uh, the effect is economic and agricultural in nature. So we have many um, molusicides developed actually, so available in the market. Um, aside from that, we also have molusicides for the control of snails that are host for the parasites, for example, uh, on Comelania quadrasi, on Cupensis quadrasi. I think those are some of the uh, the controls uh, mechanisms for the elimination of uh, these snails. Thank you. Uh, from Dr. Ian, Kendrick Fontanilia. Hi, Ian. Hi. His question is, do we have marine snails in the Philippines that have been used as a source of dye similar to the muricids of the Mediterranean? Uh, I did not encounter any uh, any any specimens or any species that uh, are exploited as a form of colorant compared to uh, a kind of snail or mollus in Mediterranean uh, used by Phoenicians, etc. That that what they call the royal purple, okay, or the Phoenician purple, okay. But in the Philippines, um, the use of mollus in our ornaments or in our clothes are for decorative purposes. For example, some buttons, necklaces, bracelets. Uh, those are the common ways by which we make use of mollusks in our fashion. Thank you. I, I, I agree because um, with the hornbill ornaments, you can add um, uh, parts of the oyster, the makintab na part ng oyster, and they add that to yeah. the one. In, in the knocker layer. Yeah. Oh, from Dr. Decibel Slava. Um, my interest is in paleobiogeography. My question is, do we have a good number of land mollusks with known first appearances in terms of the geologic time scale? Um, actually, we have very limited, uh, we have very limited research on that, okay. Um, but I think one attempt uh, was conducted by a colleague of mine, Dr. Giselle uh, Batomalake, where in, in her PhD dissertation, she tried to somehow establish the origin of the helicostyline land snails. Is it out of Luzon, out of Mindanao, or out of Palawan, or what? Okay. So the findings is out of Luzon. Okay. So based from geological records, before the connection of Palawan 
to Borneo or Mindanao to Borneo, there's uh, based from a publication, there's an ancient connection between Taiwan to Luzon and Taiwan connected to mainland Asia. Okay, so um, that's a possible route for the, uh, for the introduction of these land snails from uh, the continents okay, and speciated in our islands. Another way is some of these land snails or some of the moss in general can be dispersed in different ways. For example, uh, via air or typhoon since we are in a typhoon belt. Okay? And even some are dispersed using birds. Okay? So because some of the birds or some of the snails can withstand the enzymes of these birds and when they're pooped out, they can still survive and introduce to a new places. So these are some of the ways by which they are uh, introduced. But in, in terms of a very uh, comprehensive study on using a fossil snail as a marker for the, uh, the geological history of our islands, I think uh, very few uh, work or wala pa yata masyadong research na ginagawa doon. Yeah, a lot of the DNA has to be sequenced and for each species yes. to be able to create the phylogeny and, and, and calibrate that to, to create the time. Yeah. And yes. then do a dispersal vicarious analysis. That would be yes. interesting. It's something people can do. Yes. Um, um, they set pa ng questions on the other side. Oh, kind of questions. I have to go to Pijama Tagalatay. From being the also, sir, is there snail farming in the Philippines now? And what kind of snails are being farmed and for what? Okay. So land snails in the Philippines, land snail farming in the Philippines is still not, uh, we're not yet doing that. Okay. As compared, for example, in Europe, particularly in France, okay, wherein they are uh, culturing, for example, sepia or helix, okay, the helix snails. So these are the ones that are being used for escargot, okay? Um, and some countries, for example, New Zealand and Australia are also beginning to culture land snails. But in the Philippines, since we have, what? We are more familiar eating marine snails compared to land snails. I think it's not as popular as we want it to be, but we have potential, okay? One attempt was conducted by Dr. Delara, wherein she attempted to culture under laboratory conditions, Risota, Otahitan, or Arbayuko. And she found out it's very difficult to culture them because this is very edible and being hunted down almost to extinction in other parts, in, in, uh, in southern Luzon and other parts of the country. Okay? But unfortunately, based from her findings, it's very difficult to culture because they are very much dependent on a particular environmental condition. So, and because of their size, it would take them more than three years just to mature and produce eggs. Okay, so in terms of logistics, it's quite very difficult to do. And her recommendation is just let them be in their natural environment and just make sure that they are happy there because of the logistics of maintaining a culture of these endemic edible landsnails that we have. That's why, for example, in areas of the Philippines wherein we have known uh, consumption of land snails, for example, in Batanes, in Cebu, in uh, Bicol region. Okay, uh, these areas have land snails that are listed in the new red list. Okay, because of uncontrolled consumption, because most of them they would just collect from the from the wild, and most of these land snails would take years just to reproduce, and so that's unsustainable. So I think more research can be done in proper in, um, ex situ culture of land snails that not just for farming, but also for conservation. As it seems the uh, public has to be aware of uh, these threatened species and they should go to find Dow 2019-09, which now <laughs> includes the list of threatened land mollusks. In the yes. Before kasi wala. So it's amazing that it's now added so they'd be aware which ones are prohibited to collect. So that means yes. um, snail caviar is out of the question. Uh, maybe if we uh, remember, for example, in the case of Artahong, Arperna viridis, before the 1950s, it was considered as pest 
for oyster farmers. But later on, we develop a liking for the tahong. Then eventually, the culture of eating tahong further develop up till right now. So I think proper introduction to the Filipinos, it might be very difficult, but we can try. Okay, um, I think we still have time. So continue on. What is the most common factor that affects the decline of some species of snails? And how can we conserve them? Connected to the threat and waste. Yeah, so the number one threat is habitat destruction, actually. So forest, uh, reduction of forest cover, okay? Because, for example, most of our native land snails, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about land snails because that's I have experience with, okay? Because uh, land snails, they're quite picky with the, with the environment that they're in. So they are not, they cannot thrive in a very warm environment, very dry environment. So these are the conditions that must be satisfied. And if, for example, and we have 7,000 plus islands and most of these islands and, this, and these islands would have mountains where have rainforest and when we destroy them, so these are centers of endemism, okay? So if we destroy the forest, the cars, the hills, etc., we can actually easily extirpate their species. So habitat destruction is number one. Um, yon. And if uh, so go for freshwater uh, and marine, you have pollution. And I, another one, I think, is unregulated human consumption, <laughs> unregulated collection, especially our snails are quite beautiful and very attractive for shell trade. So, yung um, uh, ng practices are some of the threats for our uh, models, I think. Especially because we have a lot of these uh, kind of rare and very valuable marine snails. Like uh, I think we have Gloria Maris and yes. golden cowrie. Yes, and and we have even the emperors of Japan uh, collecting our marine shells actually because of their rarity. Thank you. So I have another question from Kirk Charai. Uh, are there any taxa that are solely dependent on snails, marine or terrestrial, for food? Ooh, it's my side of the malusivores. <laughs> yes, okay, so there are some specialists. Okay, so we have birds, for example, thrushes, okay, that would uh, are very dependent. So their bills are, uh, are designed for holding the snail. Um, most of them, they are not directly crushing the snail, but they make use of anvils. So these anvils are rocks. Okay, for example, we can observe this in Mount Makiling and even in Batanes, wherein you have clusters of crack shells. Okay, and these are due to the birds, for example. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not familiar with the species of birds. They are just birds, so help me, JCM. <laughs> but yeah, so those are some. Um, and we also have ano pa ba? Yon. so most of our birds uh, are very much dependent. Um, ah, we have one. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, Varanus olivaceus, this is Botaan, which is an endemic uh, Varanus uh, lizard in Polillo, in southern Luzon, up to Bicol region. So aside from eating pinanga uh, or yung mga, and uh, pili, okay, which are hard fruits, okay, their teeth are also designed in crushing mollusk, okay, so there's a high correlation on the design, they have blunt teeth that are designed for crushing the shell, okay, so those are examples of animals that are very much dependent or designed for mollusivory. And you actually have a paper on this, so you can promote my <laughs> paper on, on the blood. I'm just working on it. <laughs> uh, from um, Joshua Bacunador um, from UPB, um, it was stated that Region 7 Central Visayas has the highest malacological research and collection distribution. Do you think the number of journal articles and museum collections 
be affected by recent projects like reclamations, such as the proposed 174 hectare reclamation in the Magetic was a very specific question. Well, reclamation can cannot only affect mollusks, but an entire ecosystem. Okay, so obviously there is an effect on the ecosystem, not just mollusks. Okay, so fish and other uh, marine organisms. Now, for your question, why is there a high uh, frequency of research emanating? Actually, that's the reason why you have the title, Silip sa Kagahapon. It's a Visayan term for Silip sa Kagahapon. That is the reason because this is a homage. Why? Because most of the malacological research are coming from the Visayan region. So I think the reason is um, this is surrounded by water. Okay, most of the islands here. So you have high affinity and also have uh, during the time, uh, as you've heard uh, in my lecture, most of the explorers, uh, European explorers would go into Visayan islands for the collection of marine and terrestrial because of siguro preference, okay? Preference to these islands, kaya mas marami silang output. But unfortunately, uh, based from also our research, uh, we found out that even though by land area, uh, Mindanao is next to Luzon, there are very few researches, malacological in nature, that are emanating from this island. Why? Because there are very few workers, okay? So this can change if uh, more workers, Mindanawan as malacologists would emerge and contribute to the science, I guess. Uh, that's a very nice question. Um, what is your favorite species of snail and mollusk? <laughs> I have many, but I give you three. The first one is radix, quadrasi. This is the freshwater snail because of sentimental value because the first snail that I've studied for my undergraduate thesis. Even my email is radix squad. <laughs> Um, the second one is uh, Risotta of Haitana. Uh, this is the land snail of uh, Mount Makiling uh, because of it's very easy to collect. <laughs> it's very large. It's uh, amazing because the first time I've countered, I never seen a snail as big as that one. It's one of, even Risotta as a genus is the largest land snail that we have in the Philippines. And the third one is Lecha fragilis. This is an endemic land snail found in Leyte and parts of Samar. Why? Because of its color. Okay, so it's green with bands. And we made an initial attempt to somehow study whether the value or the significance of this stripe is to mimic uh, some snakes uh, in order to come up uh, to some of, as a form of deterrent. Okay, so we have different interesting snails and mollusks here in the Philippines. We have a mollusk that would have a tail that would wag as a, like a dog. We have a jumping land snails found in Cebu. And we have a snail that would harbor a beetle in their body as a symbiote. So we have many interesting finds here in the Philippines. I hope we have the, the very interesting cephalopod vampire toothless infernalis, which is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, from Dr. Fang, the Japanese hey, snail was introduced to the Philippines as forest food for the Japanese soldiers during World War II. Is this true? How about developing it as a gourmet cuisine siguro, just like the home? Uh, yes, as I mentioned, uh, the Japanese uh, introduced this land snail as an emergency food. It's very convenient <laughs> for them, okay? Um, well, in terms of consumption of akatina, well, again, it's, uh, we are not used eating land snails actually in the Philippines, uh, compared, for example, in Africa, where they're, they're eating a lot. Uh, there's also a value of not eating these land snails because some of them, most of them, would carry parasites. Example would be Angiostrum gallus cantonensis. This is a worm that can uh, infect our central nervous system and can cause paralysis and even death. Okay, so um, I think we can develop um, other species, but I would not recommend eating a katina <laughs> because of that sole reason of. Uh, being an intermediate host for this parasite. <laughs> okay, I'm going to switch to this side. Um, is, it a po is it possible for dentalium species to occupy a freshwater environment? 
Ah, okay. So, based from the biology of dental, yung, it's quite difficult for them because they don't have the um, anatomy and the physiology to adapt to a freshwater environment. So, most of the organs of dentalium or the tusk snails are highly reduced or even absent. Okay, so they don't have a specialized organ that would withstand the uh, shift in the osmotic gradient from the marine to uh, fresh water. But we don't know. Evolution works. Maybe in the near future. Of course, another question from Joshua Tan. Do you think some of these smallest like the octopuses are in the Philippines could be used for ecotourism in the future. Yes, um, but but we have to take note the behavior of octopus. They are highly secretive organisms, and some are very venomous. Okay, so uh, in terms, so maybe during snorkeling or diving, yes, you can observe them, but don't touch them. Okay. Um, I think that's those are some of the ways by which we can make use of them as a uh, a tourist uh, as a part of a pristine uh, marine environment. I think that's the role of you know, octopus. Yeah, some of my interesting, uh, my favorite ones is the is it the mimic octopus. Yes. So yeah, it it's it yeah. might be difficult to part, be part of Ecuador if you can't find it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's go to mag um, octopus watching. Pag mahirap sila. Okay. Um, I think I'll have my last question. Um, mine is about our national hero, Dr. Jose Rizal, who was, I think, was just known to collect malacological specimens during the exile in Dapitan. And I think he sent them to European museums for exchange for books. Um, I, I don't know if one was named, I'm not sure if one was named after or several was named after. Would you consider Dr. Rizal to be a malacologist given that? Yes, actually. Uh, he's a conchologist. Conchologists are malacologists. So he's a malacologist. And uh, to tell you, uh, Rizal's work on malacological research is not restricted and limited during his time in the Pitan. Okay, actually has some drafts in uh, description of mollus and cephalopod species even, but he did not finish it. I don't know why. Um, even he incorporated that in his comics, as I've said, in the tale of the, the turtle and the monkey. Okay, And he even make use of snails as an indicator for um, freshness of the uh, water. Okay, Because he observed that if you put uh, we observed that most of the uh, pristine waters, they have snails, more snails. So he's an ecotoxicologist uh, also. So uh, so he's a well-versed malacologist, I guess. So that adds to all this list of... Uh, yeah. of it's amazing. Okay. And so I think we have, that is our last... Oh, may pahabol si Ma'am Fuang, last asiguro. Considering culture of Katinas, so the parasites can be avoided. Considering their easy availability, these pixels can be very good. And I don't think that's a question. Ah, comment siguro. Okay, ma'am. Okay, I think that's it. So again, um, to wrap up, that as, um, is there are no other questions? Double check. Yeah. So the MNH Quincentil Commemoration Webinar Series, um, I comment, I'm sorry, but I just added that to my comment. That was, again, a great discussion for everyone. Thank you very much for your questions. Again, thank you, Dr. De Chavez, for, for answering all this in our open forum. Um, everyone, let us congratulate our speaker for a very splendid presentation and, of course, for the open forum. To show our gratitude for your inspiring talk, allow me to present this electronic certificate of recognition signed by our director, Mar Dr. Marian Pulido de Leon for serving as research person in this fifth webinar in the Baliktanao series, entitled Silip sa Kagahapon, Moluscan Research and Collections from the Spanish Period to the Present. Again, let us give, all, let us all give Dr. Emmanuel Ryan Zide Chavez a virtual round of applause. Virtual and yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. De Chavez, for, for a very splendid talk. Okay, so to formally close today's MNH Quisentil Commemoration Webinar Series, 
let me get out a few reminders before we end the webinar. So on the screen you have there, please evaluate the seminar to get a certificate of participation. The link is flashed on the screen and copied in the chat box of our Zoom and the comments area of our YouTube live post. You can also use your mobile phones to scan the QR code shown in the slide. So yes, so you have the time to click that scan. Please click on the link provided so that you will be able to give your evaluation immediately. We will only accept responses until 3 p.m. today. Again, the QR code opens to the following links, bit.ly slash mnhqcc dash eval or bit.do slash mnhqcc dash eva or eva. Okay, so I think that's it. So we thank the following organizations and people for all the support, resources, and inspiration. As you see, they're listed from the National Defense Committee of the Philippines, of course, from UPLB, the Office of the Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor Committee of Affairs, Museum of Natural History, the local organiz organizing committee. Um, and I, I'd like to thank the, today's session coordinator, Michelle San Pasqual, and technical assistant, Julius Parpon, and the ITC staff, Maki Agsunod, and our, of course, overall coordinator, Florenti Cruz, and his co-coordinator, Alvin Fardo, and our two are MNH Director Dr. De Leon and distinguished speaker Dr. De Chavez for a successful fifth webinar of the series. Finally, please follow the UPLB Museum. UPLB Museum is one word. And on our social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Yes, we have our YouTube channel. You can also backtrack on the previous uh, four other webinars. And of course, Instagram. Also visit the UPLB MNH webpage for further details about the webinar series and other activities of the museum. And let us now end this webinar, but we hope to see you next on our next seminar entitled Microbiology in Philippine Cuisine, Then and Now, to be delivered by our curator for microbes, Dr. Noel G. Sabino on July 28, 2021. So we'll see you on July 28, 2021. So, Closing now, as keep safe, wash your hands regularly, follow by safety protocols, at maraming salamat po sa inyong pagtakilik sa ating webinar, and see you on our next QCC webinar. Please be sure, make sure you log out of the Zoom for security purposes, and thank you.